Okay, so what about these, what about the, this additional kind of thing that I was alluding to here? How does that come in to our story? So, so far in our story, we haven't really talked about Wilson coefficients, except to say that they could be constrained by reparameterization invariants to be absent. So let's think about Wilson coefficients now. Obviously, that's something important. And the way that Wilson coefficients can come in is the following way. They can depend on the large momenta that were at order one. And one way of denoting that is by saying that they depend on label operators. OK, so nothing stops that. But if we want the momentum that's picked out by this label operator to be gauge invariant, then we should act on products of fields that are collinear gauge invariant. So the way that we should set it up is to have an operator, well, here's the kind of notation that's sometimes used, where the operator acts on both fields, the C bar and the W. Because of our formulas for the label operator, we could also write this as a label operator acting to the left if we wanted. So what this, what this Wilson coefficient is, is the function. It's not just a, simply a number. And it picks out the momentum of this product of fields. And that's because that product is collinear gauge invariant. So it's a well-defined thing to talk about. OK, so that's actually the general structure that whenever we have these products of fields that are collinear gauge invariant, if we ask what the Wilson coefficient could be a function of, it can be a function of the momentum of those products. So one way of writing this in a sort of more elegant fashion is as follows. So take this guy and write it as a delta function in the following way. OK, so if I do the integral over this omega, then I would just get back that I stick the p-bar dagger inside the Wilson coefficient and that it acts on this product of fields. But if I write it this way, what I get is that my Wilson coefficients are just functions of a number, not functions of an operator. And my operators have these delta functions in them. But then could depend on some variables that are distinguishing those delta functions. OK? So in general, products of fields like this, we have to th think about their momenta as being something that we could label, if you like. We label it by omega. Because it's a collinear gauge invariant concept, the Wilson coefficients can depend on those momenta. And then we have Wilson coefficients that depend on those momenta and operators that are just labeled by those momenta. And this is the convolution formula that I sort of promised you at the beginning of the discussion of SCT that was going to show up. And now it's shown up. OK, so Wilson coefficients can depend on those large order one momenta. And traditionally, they're written as integrals, even though you could think of them as sums at this point, and it wouldn't make much difference. So this here is what's called hard collinear factorization in the traditional QCD literature, because it's telling you how hard degrees of freedom, which are encoded in our Wilson coefficients, can talk to collinear degrees of freedom, which are encoded in our operators. In SCT, that's just come out kind of of the formalism in a very sort of simple way. In QCD, you'd have to use warded entities and work hard to get what I just derived for you in a couple lines. So 
we're kind of done for today. And we've seen kind of two examples of mode factorization in the effective theory, collinear and ultrasoft fields and collinear and hard degrees of freedom, and how it simplifies the discussion of sort of factorization, uh, in, which is kind of a traditional, in a more traditional language, which I haven't taught you, but you can believe me, is more complicated than what we've discussed. So we'll talk a little bit more about this next time, and then we'll talk about how the ideas that we have here lead us just to define a set of objects that we build operators from. And once we know what those objects are, then we can kind of dispense with a lot of the steps that we've done and just jump right to building operators out of those objects. But the steps here are necessary to understand why it's those objects that we want to build operators from. Okay, so any questions? So we'll talk a little bit about how this generalizes to other operators next time, besides so just the one I, I did here.